Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you could join with us today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am Caitlin Hodge, and I am the secretary of the EORE Advisory Group. So on behalf of this advisory group, I am happy to kick off this EORE hour. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, this is an event that happens on the last Wednesday of every month. We've had three so far. Uh, one focused on harmonized approaches in West and Central Africa, and then two webinars on digital approaches to EORE. So I'm really glad uh, to open this one. Um, it is The topic is going to be implementing a risk mitigation project, Lessons from Mosul, and it's hosted by the HALO Trust. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and like all the ones before it, will be shared within a couple weeks on the Advisor Group's YouTube channel. Um, so greetings to everyone who's joining us at a later date uh, by watching the recording. I'm personally very excited for this webinar. Um, I've had the privilege of witnessing this project evolve over the last two years, and I think it has a lot to offer in terms of many of the good practices that um, we in the advisor group are consistently advocating for. It's community-driven, it's evidence-based, and it embraces a broader risk reduction approach that goes beyond mine action and involves integration with other sectors. The webinar today is going to be one hour, and that will be followed like the last time with a 15 minute networking circle. So that's an opportunity to meet um, other people, make connections with other professionals around the world. Um, and I do hope you will be able to stay for that. So with all that said, it's my pleasure now to hand over the floor to Kim Fletcher of the Halo Trust to get this webinar started. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Can I confirm that you can see the screen? Yep, and here you are. Perfect, thank you. And thanks also to everyone for joining today. I'm Kim Fletcher, as Caitlin mentioned. I'm HALO's representative with the EORE Advisory Group. And I'll just give some quick background to the project that we'll be talking about and to the panelists and then pass it over to them. In 2020, Unmasked Iraq pulled, put out a call for proposals to deliver risk education in Mosul Old City but they added a component that we don't often see. And that is that they also wanted the operators to work with the community to determine who was most at risk from EONY and to implement a to be determined risk mitigation project that focused on a reckless or forced risk-taking group. So HALO in partnership with Al God League for Women and Children received the contract. And since the concept for the project was relatively new, HALO, Al God and Unmass all faced unique challenges and we think learn some lessons that can be applied across the mine action sector. So today those involved have offered to share those lessons. There are four speakers on the panel and each offer a different perspective on the project. The first speaker will be Celine Chang and Celine developed the call for proposals while she was working with Unmass and she oversaw the initial grant implementation. Celine will be speaking today in a personal capacity regarding how the idea for the project came about and the key takeaways for other donors looking to take a similar approach. Following Celine is Madeline A. Church, who is now a location manager for Halo Angola, but she was the primary person responsible for writing the proposal, which came with its own challenges. And the panel will conclude with Mohammed Jassim and India McGraw, who managed the project for Al Ghad and for Halo. And so they'll discuss the challenges and what they learned from the implementation standpoint. We will have time for questions and answers at the end, so please feel free to put those in the chat as we go. And if there are any questions we don't have time to answer, we'll share responses and writing in the follow-up to this webinar. So thanks again, and I will now pass it over to Celine. Thanks, Kim. So as previously highlighted by Kim, I'm at this webinar on a personal capacity, but was kindly asked by Halo Trust to join, as I'm also the former staff member of the project's donor, Unmass, and contributed to the development of the call for proposal. I also oversaw the first few months of its implementation, including the months when the barrier analysis was designed and implemented. So over the next few minutes, what I want to talk about is how this project idea came about and offer a few reflections on my thoughts on the project during its initial period. So um, at the time that the call for proposal was being developed, Unmatched Iraq's risk education projects had largely focused on awareness raising and mass communications. So that largely addresses the unaware, the misinformed, and the uninformed groups. There had also been some community-based activities, 
such as training of community focal points and development of community safety committees, but nothing that at the time I felt intentionally addressed the reckless or the forced risk-taking groups. Meanwhile, though, at both national and international level, there was this recognition, or there is still this recognition, that there needs to be more that is done to address these particular groups. And this we were seeing especially problematic in Iraq, in Mosul. So in particular, um, there was one case study that I read in Iraq that really stayed with me. And this case study was about a single mother who was going into a hazardous area to collect scrap metal. A risk education team saw her and spoke to her about the dangers of explosive ordnance. And at the end of the discussion, the mother acknowledged the dangers of explosive ordnance, but said that as long as she didn't have a stable income, she would continue to enter the hazardous areas to feed her two boys. And so although this is just one case study, we knew that it wasn't a unique phenomenon. And I myself had personally seen such behavior when I was working in Iraq over numerous occasions. And so this is where this project idea largely arose from, from this understanding that there was a need to target explicitly the reckless and the intentional risk-taking groups in Iraq. And at that time, uh, to my knowledge, there weren't any specific projects that really focused uh, on this group in the country. So it was a new project for Unless Iraq at the time. Um, and I was most concerned about not being able to put the vision onto paper and guide potential bidders to understand exactly what we were looking for. Um, particularly, I remember being quite worried about how we were going to be able to justify the linkage between the dangerous behavior and the solution that would be proposed to resolve the dangerous behavior. But within UNMAS, everyone was really supportive of the idea. And I think that this is a really good example of a time when a donor was willing to take a risk to innovate and to adopt a new approach that if executed correctly, would potentially have a life-changing impact on a very important group at risk of explosive ordinance. So in terms of the project implementation, um, as, I can, as I said, I can only speak up to the barrier analysis, but as a whole, I was really excited about this new method that they were using to analyze why certain groups are influenced to adopt certain behaviors and not others, and how or what kind of solutions could be used to overcome this problematic. Um, I was also really excited to see the inclusion of behavior change oriented questions, such as uh, what do your friends think or say, whose opinions matter to you the most, inside the barrier analysis, which was really relevant to the project, obviously, but it was also um, really relevant to the greater risk education sector in Iraq so that we can continuously adopt uh, and, and adapt our future risk education messages and materials. The only thing I would say that I was hesitant about um, at the time was that, uh, as we know now, the Halo Trust, they decided to target the reckless um, group, the youth. Um, but I felt that there had been more clear linkages between the intentional risk-taking group uh, and the threat of explosive ordinance. And this was probably largely due to me being influenced by the case study that I previously mentioned, uh, as well as personal observations in Iraq. Um, I think to resolve this, we probably needed to have a larger sample size in the initial analysis, if I remember correctly, it was quite small. And in addition, I think it would have been good to try different methodologies of the data collection. Uh, so HALO Trust, they used key informant interviews, focus group discussions, and the barrier analysis. But I think other methods, which are mentioned in the GISHD working paper on measuring the results of EORE, could have been used, such as the observation method, would have been really interesting to try and complement um, what Halo Trust had used. That being said, um, again, I was really excited about the barrier analysis methodology, and I think that both Halo Trust and Elgad did a great job of really engaging with the community and having the target group there to provide a solution uh, to the problem. So looking forward, um, I really hope that this, uh, these kinds of projects will be continued and that um, other organizations um, will have a chance to, to pilot uh, such new approaches. Um, I think these opportunities are vital to improve our capacity as a sector to provide adapted and relevant risk education that truly targets behavior change. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm now gonna pass on to Madeline. Thanks. Okay, 
Um, thanks very much, Celine. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Madeline. Um, as Kim mentioned, I currently work with Halo in Angola. But when this project was launched, I was working as a program officer in Iraq. And so I was the primary author of Halo's submission. Um, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, our experience with this call for proposal and how we chose to respond to it. Uh, next slide, please, Kim. Thank you. Um, so when we received this call for proposal, I think we were um, aware from the outset that this was quite a different project to others we had bid on before. Um, as Celine said, it was something innovative um, and different. And I think we also knew it would re require a lot of research and preparation because it was new for us as well. Um, but ultimately, I think we decided it was something really interesting that um, was worth bidding on and, and seeing if we could be part of this exciting um, undertaking that Unmass was, was choosing to do. Um, so just to sort of illustrate um, what we saw when the call for proposal came out, um, the objective that Unmass was asking implementers um, to achieve was to reduce the number of deaths and injuries caused by explosive hazards. And that first part is, is fairly standard, I think, for a risk education project. But where it um, was, was quite different was in the second part, which asked us to do this by implementing an alternative approach to enhance safe behaviour. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, in other words, and I think, I think Celine's example is the case study that she mentioned was a really good illustration of this. Um, we were asked not just to uh, do risk education by providing people with the knowledge that they can use to make informed decisions, but we were being asked to engage with them on another level as well. And that was to mitigate risk um, by nudging people towards um, behaving in a safe manner. Next, please. So the theoretical underpinning of our um, proposal was that we would use the behavior change approach. And this is a methodology that's been used successfully in other humanitarian sectors, um, including public health and WASH. And in simple terms, it's a way of working really closely with um, target populations to identify the barriers that inhibit the desirable behaviors that you want to see in people. And then once you have a very clear understanding of what those barriers are, you can develop a specific and targeted approach to help people to overcome them. Um, what makes this uh, very useful is there's a lot of literature that exists um, about this approach um, and examples, as I mentioned, from other sectors. Um, and if you're so inclined, there's a lot of um, you know, wider research and you can go down some interesting rabbit holes from psychology and, and behavioral economics about what, make, um, you know, what makes people tick. <laughs> um, but for us, um, what was also really useful was that there's a lot of good toolkits and guides um, that already exist online to help um, implement this methodology. Uh, next, please. So for us, um, we had the challenge of taking these concepts and theories and then um, turning them into a more concrete sort of proposal. Um, what Unmass asked for in their call for proposal was um, to achieve three outputs, but I'm gonna focus on the first two uh, because output one um, needed to happen before we could even plan output two. So output one was to um, undertake the um, participatory community consultations. And we needed to do that step uh, in order to understand people's behaviors and the drivers of those behaviors. Um, 
And then only once we had done that first phase, could we think about taking the lessons from that phase and um, designing a behavior change mechanism that appropriately addressed it. Okay, uh, next please, Kim. So in essence, our proposal really just focused on that first phase um, of community consultation. Um, so as Celine mentioned, we looked at um, how we would work with communities um, in order to properly understand the drivers of their behavior. And um, we proposed um, desk-based research, focus groups, and key informant interviews. And then finally, a barrier analysis, which was, I guess, the backbone of this process. Um, the barrier analysis, in essence, is um, a tool that helps you get to the heart of the drivers of people's behaviors. Um, you take the people who, a group of people who already display the behavior you want to see, and a group of people who do not yet do that behavior, and you ask very specific and targeted questions about their um, drivers, and then you compare those answers. And somewhere in that space, you should be able to pinpoint um, what it is that is causing people um, to undertake particular behaviors. Um, and in theory, you know, that's what will help you to determine the best um, intervention to, to help change people's behavior. Um, India will, I think, go into more detail about how this um, worked in practice. Okay, next slide, please. So when we were writing this proposal, we were very aware that we needed to partner with a local organization um, for this to be implemented successfully. Um, at the time, Halo wasn't operating in Mosul and the uh, um, community participation element of this project was just was so integral to its success that we knew we needed to work with a partner who was experienced in Mosul, who knew the community and um, would really facilitate all of that discussion. So we were really lucky um, that Al Gadli chose to partner with us. Um, and obviously that partnership um, in implementation will be, will be covered um, by India and Mohammed. Um, we also uh, asked GICHD if they would come on board as um, an external advisor to conduct some periodic reviews um, of how the project was um, succeeding or um, in need of um, redirection with regard to gender and diversity. Okay, thanks, Kim, next slide. So obviously this was a very new um, and innovative project and necessarily it came with some challenges. Um, this was the first time we, or certainly I had um, written a proposal of this nature. So it was definitely a learning experience. Um, as I've mentioned, the biggest challenge was that we didn't at this stage know what our behavior change mechanism would be. And that was completely intentional and that was the best way to design this project, but it wasn't necessarily perfectly suited to your traditional proposal format. Um, so we couldn't write a very exact budget and we couldn't put together a monitoring and evaluation plan that was really closely aligned to the activities we wanted to perform because we didn't know exactly what they would be yet. Um, so I think if this process was to be, be repeated, my biggest recommendation from having um, written the proposal would be to sort of split that process so that implementers or prospective implementers are asked to um, just address that first community consultation phase and that uh, um, they're evaluated on that. And then, you know, if, if you have um, a flexible donor, then, you know, ideally re-enter a discussion about um, the budget and the particulars of the second phase where you know what your behaviour change mechanism will be. Okay, next please, Kim. Okay, and then finally, I mean, obviously, um, there were some challenges, but 
this um, was a really, really interesting project to be a part of. And um, I think there were a lot of really promising elements um, that made it, um, you know, an exciting piece of work to be part of. So um, as Caitlin mentioned at the outset, it was something that was based on research um, and it drew on successes that we've seen in other humanitarian fields. Um, it was something new and innovative for mine action. Um, so for us, it was um, really, really important to be a part of that. And then um, throughout and you know, from, from the very beginning, um, it was integral to this project that it be community-based and participatory, which um, I think, you know, shone through the whole way. And then finally, um, I think we received this call for a proposal in around May 2020, and it necessarily was responsive to the pandemic and asked us to write um, an alternative methodology that would allow us to implement the project remotely. Um, so I think for us as an implementer, that was really promising um, uh, to see, you know, a donor um, dedicated to continue continue work, albeit in a in a safe way. Um, okay, so that's all from me um, because I unfortunately wasn't involved in the project implementation. I left my posting in Iraq not long after, um, but we're very lucky that India McGrath took over um, and India oversaw the implementation of this project for Halo. Um, so she is going to talk to you a little bit about that experience. Thanks, Maddie. Um, and thank you, Celine, as well. Um, and thank you, Kim, for doing the slides. Um, I'm India McGrath. Um, I now work in Halo's strategy team, but I was previously the programme officer in Iraq. Um, and one of my key responsibilities was to oversee our risk mitigation project in Mosul. Next slide, please, Kim. I'm going to hand over to Mohammed Jassim um, to give some context on Mosul. Um, he's much better placed to do so. Mohammed, over to you. Thank you, India. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed Jassim. I'm working in uh, Al Ghadli, uh, formal and child care, since 2017. Uh, actually, uh, India gave me this opportunity to describe uh, a little bit about Mosul City, Mosul Old City, which I where I live. Uh, Mosul City is located in the north, uh, in the Nineveh Governorate, in the northern part of Iraq. And uh, the size of this old city is about uh, three square kilometers. And this area uh, was uh, suffered uh, from the liberation battles uh, between the Iraqi armies and uh, the ISIS members. Uh, so that about 90% 90, 90 of the old city was destroyed and the area was fully contaminated with IEDs of different types and uh, booby traps. Uh, actually, uh, for that, uh, this, uh, th th this area need uh, a clearance project and uh, providing risk education for everyone. Thank you. Hand it over to you, India. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Next slide, please, Kim. So the project, um, both Madeline and Celine have given a brief about this, so I won't go into too much detail. But um, there are basically two parts to the project, risk mitigation and risk education. Uh, we know that holistic EORE approaches bring value to the sector, but we rarely see them implemented. It's mainly due to lack of funding and also lack of capacity for this kind of integrated, integrated programming. So we were really excited to have an opportunity to deliver this project. Um, we delivered it in partnership with our GAD. Um, and really, the project was to target the unaware, forced or reckless groups. Um, and the purpose was to design and deliver an intervention that was really aimed at changing the behavior of an at-risk group in Mosul Old City. And the project provided a solution to encourage this group, who are either forced or reckless, to change their behavior. And the last point um, is the point about the community. Um, and I'll really be focusing on this a lot throughout the project because it, it really was the strengths of the project. Um, and um, how integrated and coordinated this approach was. Kim, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, 
So the open-ended nature of the call for proposals meant that the risk mitigation intervention wasn't described at the proposal stage. So we conducted a bottom-up approach where we approached a community and we designed this alongside them. And um, Madeline's just run through this, so I'll quickly give a quick brief. But um, we, we planned for the initial data collection exercise to take about 10 weeks. Uh, due to COVID, neither Kim or I were able to arrive in country. Um, so this period was shorter, we did it in eight weeks. Um, if this process had been longer, we would have been able to collect more data. And I think Celine made that point. Um, it would have been better to have more data and we'll come back to that a bit later. But this is the basic outline of our data collection. We did a desk assessment of Mosul Old City. Then we engaged with adults living in Mosul Old City through key informant interviews and community workshops. Uh, we did the community workshops on Zoom actually because of COVID. Um, and following that, we identified, well, the community identified the at-risk group, which they believed to be adolescents. Um, and then we did a behavioral survey with our at-risk group, so adolescents, and that's the barrier analysis. Um, thank you, Madeline, for the introduction to that tool, and we'll come back to that um, later. Um, but in short, the barrier analysis demonstrated that adolescents were the most at-risk group from EO accidents, or at least that's what the community felt. Um, and the reason for this was a lack of a safe space to hang out or play. Um, and so following this and following the findings of the bear analysis, we established our risk mitigation intervention, which was a park, which we will come back to. Next slide, please, Kim. Thank you. So the first phase was the desk assessment. And really the biggest challenge for this was a lack of accident data. Um, the desk assessment was, was to understand the community's behaviors, norms, attitudes, livelihoods, and other contextual information. But a key part of this was to analyze existing victim and accident data. And this is really hard in Iraq because victim, there is no central victim and accident data that had enough information for us to understand the particular behaviors that were taking place at the time of accident. And victim data is really a valuable source um, when conducting a behavior change project. So we reviewed the IMSMA database um, and that didn't have enough information about, for us to draw any conclusions. And so we also spoke to independent um, organizations gathering such as INSO. Um, MAG also had a database which was very helpful, um, but all in all, this really was the main challenge. Um, and the lack of available accident data meant that the selection of the park's location, most of Old City, and the selection of the target group was done really without the full information of the current impact of explosive ordnance, or accidents at least. And so following this, we knew we had to develop a better understanding of both who was at risk and why. And so the community engagement really became critical. We did, however, address this solution retrospectively. Um, due to COVID, our EORE teams were not able to work. And so we did retrospective victim and accident tracing. This was really the best alternative available, but we were only able to do it after the risk mitigation intervention had been established. The data we collected showed that the highest number of victims were actually men and women. And there were actually only two um, victims from the adolescent group that we had identified. Having this data available would have led to the project teams possibly making different conclusions on targeting. And it would have also allowed us to triangulate the findings from the key informant interviews and the community workshops. This has been a really interesting reflection for all of us involved in the project, because we were, um, the question of what the community wanted versus what the reality was really came to the fore. And our data collection was a bottom-up approach and therefore it was what the community wanted. However, we found later in the project that it was slightly at odds with the reality. But this is just a, a learning that we um, that we've discussed at great lengths, and actually it, it's an interesting um, finding that we weren't necessarily expecting. Next slide, please, Kim. So the the next thing we did was we engaged the community. An essential element of behavior change approaches is building a thorough understanding of your target audience. Um, and that initial engagement with the KAIs and community workshop um, and the KAIs and the community workshops 
um, actually identified three groups of concern, which was our major challenge at this stage. They identified children, teens and scrap metal collectors. However, it was determined that given the limited budget and the implementation timeframe, the impact would be made most on focusing on one target group. We decided alongside UNMAS, GICHD and ALGAD that the risk factors for children due to them being largely unaware could be addressed through traditional EORE. Meanwhile, interventions for scrap metal collectors and garbage collecting would have required a longer, a longer project and would have exceeded the budget. We also discussed that how the, this type of intervention could actually encourage dangerous behaviours for this group. Therefore, adolescents were selected as the target group. And the main lessons learned for this um, part of the project was that you really have to work alongside an organization that is very well connected to the community. And this was a real strength of working with Algad. Algad had the connections, they understood the best times um, to engage with the community and the best places. Um, Algad staff were interviewed to understand the different groups that should be taken into account. And that was the first key lesson learned. And the second one, was that more time would have allowed for more qualitative data collection. And that's a point that Celine made earlier. Next slide, please, Kim. So then our next stage was to engage with our target group, adolescents. And while the response from the community was largely uniform regarding who to target, we still needed to survey the target group to understand what the potential solution would be. And to do this, we used the barrier analysis. And this is a tool that we use to compare those who do risky things with those who don't to find out how to limit those risky behaviors. It was also used to examine particular knowledge and attitudes that prevented a particular group from changing their behavior. To separate the doers from the non-doers, four behaviors were included in the survey and we used ALGAD's contextual knowledge to determine these behaviors. These four key behaviors were touching and moving explosive items, going into areas where there is rubble nearby, going into areas where you have seen explosive items in the past, and going into areas where adults don't know. Also, due to an overwhelming preference from adults that they thought that although that their adolescents were the most at-risk group, both children and, and um, adolescents would benefit from a recreational area. And so what we did is we included a specific question related to a recreational area in the barrier analysis. 100% of the respondents thought a recreational sp space in Old City would help them to avoid unsafe areas. And so based on these findings, HALO concluded that for the behaviours, do you go to areas where adults don't go? Do you go to areas where there is rubble nearby? And do you go into areas where you have seen explosive items in the past? The drivers were forced due to a lack of a safe place to play. And therefore, within the scope of the project, play was the, play was the particular behavior that we could most effectively affect. Therefore, the decision was taken to construct a park targeting adolescents. We used the same barrier analysis tool at the end line to discover whether the same target group had reduced those, those risky behaviors, those four risky behaviors. And we've got some graphs at the end that we hope to show you in time to prove that all four risky behaviors were reduced and therefore the success of the park intervention. Kim and I also wrote an article for the Journal of Conventional Weapons and Destruction on the use of our analysis that we'd be happy to share with any who's thinking about using this tool elsewhere. And our really our key lessons learned from this process was that whichever organization is undertaking this really must be comfortable with data and analysis. The data collection required extensive training for the Algad teams, um, digital data collection tools, and a lot of training about the importance of not asking leading questions. The bar analysis itself had a lot of quantitative and qualitative um, uh, analysis that also required a lot of cross-referencing of answers. And therefore, whoever is undertaking this must be comfortable with data and analysis. Also, there would have been better if we had had more time, as statistically, you do want at least 100 doers and 100 non-doers. We had 67. We had 32 female and, th and 35 male um, take part in the barrier analysis. 
but this is linking to Celine's point. If we'd had more time, this would have allowed for more data collection and therefore a bigger sample size. I also want to note that we did continue to engage the target groups throughout the construction of the park. Next slide, please, Kim. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Mohammed to give more detail about the park and its implementation and the particular challenges and lessons learned around that. But the park opened in November 2021. I'm just going to touch on this point because I want to make the I want to make the point or the case that what we created, I was at least incredibly proud of. And there were challenges, but we really did overcome them. But most of the challenges arose from the project being much larger than we thought it was ever going to be. And this links back to the open ended nature of the CFP. So, for example, the time frame, it was a nine month project and we were suddenly engaging in building a park in Mosul Old City. As such, we went through two no, no cost extensions with Unmass to complete the construction. The second is the budget. The budget was too small because we didn't think we would be building a part a park. Halo saw additional funding, which really helped for this process, but I'm very aware that this may not have been possible without that additional funding at the end. And the last project is, a, and the last point is that neither Halo nor Algad had ever built a park before. We were very lucky to draw on external assistance from an architect. However, this was not factored in the proposal because we didn't know what we were going to be doing. And I think it would be important to recognize for next time that there would be some ability to draw on expertise from partners or, um, or external help, such as the architect that we used. But the project was a huge success. We can show you at the end how it did reduce all the barriers and an impressive 76 of all, all of the adolescents involved in the end line said that they visited the park. And the main recommendation here for me is more of a recommendation than a lessons learned. And that's that the risk mitigation project, project should really have been tended as two separate projects, a data collection exercise, and then a project implementer. And this would have helped reduce the challenges during the park's construction. Next slide, please, Kim. And so these are just some key recommendations for those who are thinking about engaging in a risk mitigation project. Allow appropriate time and resources for a comprehensive desk assessment. The second one is success depends on community engagement, empowerment and information. And therefore the community engagement must be led by an organization that is trusted by the community to ensure this, this approach. And the last one is that risk mitigation projects should be tended as two separate projects, a data collection exercise to determine what the risk mitigation project would be, and then a second tender to find the project's implementer. That's everything from me. I'm going to hand over to Mohammed Jassim, who's going to give some more detail about the implementation of the park. Mohammed Jassim is Algad's project coordinator. He's worked with Algad since 2017 um, on EORE projects with MAG and World Vision. And um, Mohammed really knows more about the implementation of this park than anyone else. So, Mohammed, over to you. Thank you, India. Thank you for the comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, actually, uh, as India said, I am the project coordinator. Uh, so I will uh, share the lesson learned uh, from al Ghat side, let's say, uh, for this project. Uh, next slide, please. Kim? Yes. Uh, the, the purpose of this project was to implement an intervention and to change the behavior of a group uh, in all city, most of all city, who is in high risk uh, of uh, explosive ordinance. So, uh, as uh, I want to say, this this project is so important uh, due to the presence of uh, destroyed buildings containing explosive ordinance. Also, the communities are unaware how of how to deal with this explosive ordinance. And also there is no enough uh, clearance project in old city and uh, the diversity of the explosive ordinance uh, in old city and the difficulty to recognize the IEDs as ISIS use different types of uh, material uh, to make it as an IEDs. Next slide, please. 
Okay, at the beginning of the project, uh, hello in partnership with Al Ghed, uh, as India and uh, said, uh, have collected the qualitative and the quantitative data to identify the people at uh, living uh, at risk. Uh, so we design a, a community-based behavioral change intervention, which is a new approach for Al Ghed. Uh, this was done through uh, the collection method, as India explained in details. Uh, so after we collecting and analyzing this. Uh, data we saw that it was found most at this group is the adolescent and it was proposed to provide a qualitative risk education and more recreational area space within the old city so regarding the first part part which include the risk education uh, and community liaison we delivered a face-to-face -face ere sessions and also we included risk mitigation messages in the in, in these sessions also we we conducted a pre and post test uh, before and after each session and sharing many many photos about safe and unsafe places to play and to hang out for the people also uh, we sharing uh, eore advertise on facebook uh, which which we, we targeted a different age category age groups uh, so for the people not attending our uh, lessons sessions uh, also we distributing coloring book uh, for, for the children attending the session and distributing uh, leaflet for the adult uh, also distributing posters in all city and we use uh, fixing uh, uh, big billboards in the targeted area that contain different type of IEDs and the hotlines for the directorate of mine action in Iraq and the civil defense next slide please Next slide. Yes. With regard to the second part, here, uh, the second part of the project, which include the phases of rehabilitation in the park, which will be, uh, which was for the target, uh, in the target area to be a safe and recreational area. The first, uh, the first phase is the selection of the park site in cooperation with the Muslim municipality. And the second phase uh, ensure the park is a free of environment in cooperation with the Tetra Tech as Tetra Tech made uh, a technical survey for the location. And after that, we became sure this area is free of environment. Uh, also this, this, the third phase is a selection of a contracting uh, company to that will uh, th that was better in the park uh, actually the these three phases uh, we expect not to time consuming, but in real uh, it consume a lot of time. Uh, we expect this to be implemented to be con to be implemented in maybe ten or or twenty days, but it consume about for more than four months uh, actually. Next slide, please. Okay, the rehabilitation works include, uh, I wish, uh, first of all, uh, cleaning the site by uh, removing the rubble and soil replacement. Also, uh, the rehabilitation includes civil work that include restoration of the room, water cycle, external fence, in addition to electrical and agriculture works. Uh, as, as India said, uh, Hello Trust and Al Ghed uh, were. It, uh, if uh, Hello Trust and Al were expert in post conflict reconstruction, uh, that lead to better understanding for the for the contracting uh, challenges. I will uh, speak in, in details about the challenge that we faced in another slide. Next slide, please. Yes, after the habitation, the park was completed. The park was officially uh, handed over to the Muslim municipality and it became a favorite place for the surrounding community. The park included uh, a green area, walkways, administration room, uh, different type of benches, a floor train, uh, children playground, arts wall, uh, a tent, uh, and free internet surface, which is very useful for the community in the old city. Uh, also, uh, the rehabilitation of the park has benefited the local population in terms of safety, uh, entertainment, and the economy, as there is many shops around the, in front of the park that get benefited from the rehabilitation of this site. Next slide, please. 
Here in this slide, I will explain in details about the challenges that we are facing uh, during the rehabilitation. At first, we, do, we did not know what we are going to do. Uh, so as you know, uh, we just uh, make the community to lead this and to select what, they are, uh, the, what are the project to, uh, to do. So they select the rehabilitation the park. So at first, we don't know what we are going to do. Uh, and when we decided to do that, the budget was limited uh, for such a project. So we, we uh, additional funding was secured to, to complete this project. Uh, another challenge, uh, neither Hello Trust and Al Ghad has, has implemented a rehabilitation project before, uh, as we are not UNDP. Uh, so uh, we face a little challenge in this aspect. Uh, the major uh, challenge that I want to share is the process of the obtaining the approval to rehabilitate the park is in, it takes several months, as I said, uh, as we need to coordinate with several uh, departments in the municipality and the real estate department, uh, the mayor of Mosul, the governor of Mosul. So one is using the good contracting company. Uh, we, we are not uh, expert in this field, so we, we depend on the CVs, and uh, which is not good, actually. Uh, the last problem or change is the inconsistent bill of quantities, as the contractor make a bill of quantity, and the, uh, the municipality committee make another, and this, these two bills not matches, and we face many problems in this aspect. Next slide, please. Okay, the lessons learned uh, in this uh, in my part. Uh, so, design a realistic work, to work plan as this project was open ended uh, and we not expect what to do. Uh, also, my idea is for rehabilitating uh, uh, maybe partnership with a local NGO specialized in civil works, as Al Ghad is specialized in uh, child protection and education. So, also choosing a good contracting company with a good experience without relying on CVs. Uh, also, from my from my point of view, hiring a field engineer to follow up the work daily. And also another point to focus on to provide an accurate, uh, detailed bill of quantities in cooperation with the supervising municipality committee and the executing company. Next slide, please. Okay, regarding the park sustainability, which is very important things, uh, there is a problem in the management management of the park due to the lack of uh, staff in most municipality, which poses a threat to the sustainability of the project. To overcome this problem, uh, we have implemented two guards uh, for the period between the completion of the rehabilitation and, uh, the period, uh, and the date to hand it over the park to the municipality. But the problem, uh, this is the responsibility of the municipality to manage and to take care about the park uh, property. So also due, the, due to the open-ended nature of the project and the limited budget, uh, we and uh, al Ghad and the Hello Trust could not ensure the maintenance. As I said, is the, the responsibility of the municipality. Also at the beginning of the project, we, we introduced a community uh, uh, committee, community park committee. So we 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 engage the community uh, in this uh, in, the, in this site in this uh, part uh, to be a link between Al Ghad and the local uh, governorate. And but it's hard to continue with this uh, committee as the project uh, was ended. Uh, also, it is difficult uh, to protect the park property from the abusers, which is uh, as the park is open all, all the day and maybe some abuser come and make uh, uh, some damage to the park property. Next slide, please. Okay, just I want to say here uh, that uh, I want to share the information that in this project, uh, as Al Ghad, we got a capacity building uh, in this uh, in this project, as we, which is the first project that 
that we engaged the community with us and we provided not just a risk education, but we also work for risk mitigation, which is a new approach for Al Ghad. As, uh, as I said, we implemented many projects regarding the risk education with different NGOs, but it's the first time we implemented such a project. Thank you. Hand it to you, Kim. Thank you so much, Mohammed, and to all of the panelists. Thank you for contributing today. So we are gonna now start with some Q&A. And it looks like there's already a question in the chat. There are a few questions in the chat. So the first one that I see here is, did we raise the issues and challenges of construction in the park in the, in the um, protection cluster? So India, I think that would be one for you to start with. Hi, Kim, sorry about that. Um, no, we didn't. We didn't at the time. Um, Mohammed, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Mohammed was our permanent staff member based in Mosul. Um, I was based in, in Baghdad. But no, we didn't raise the challenges as a construction in the protection cluster. Yeah. Um, is that correct, Mohammed? Yes, it's correct. All right, thank you very much. One more in the chat is, did HALO have any challenges related to risk education for IEDs in Mosul? And Mohammed, you touched on that. Do you want to say anything further on that regard, on our RE specifically related to IEDs? Uh, actually, uh... Uh, we, we delivered uh, a risk, a quality of risk education session, sessions in all city, but I think there is no challenge because we try to explain in details using a flip chart and, and the posters, leaflet, billboards. We explain the majority of the uh, IEDs uh, in all cities. I think there is no challenge for that. Right, thanks, Mohammed. And if I could actually ask the panelists if you're willing to put your cameras back on just so that everybody is up together, that would be fantastic. Dominic, I see you have your hand raised. What questions do you have? Hi, Kim, hi everyone. Um, I, I was just gonna make the point, you know, to kind of pay credit to Halo and Algad in this project for really um, uh, implementing the project in a very gender and diversity sensitive way and taking great care to do so in the community engagement uh, aspect, in the data collection, and then also in actually adapting the activities. I mean, we're focusing in the conversation on the behavior change aspect, but there's also a risk education aspect where there were challenges in reaching uh, women and adolescent girls uh, due to COVID. And um, the decision was uh, to, to increase uh, the social media um, targeting of those groups. So I think that was all done um, uh, really well. And I think, uh, I guess if I have a question or a point, it's about, um, this, this point on the effectiveness of the targeting. So uh, India pointed out that, in fact, you know, this was done in the absence of accident data, which is a real kind of impediment to, to, to doing this effectively. So I think it was great of what was done to, to kind of do a backdated look at the, the, the accidents and, and uh, victim data. But um, that obviously does kind of impact the, the uh, effectiveness. The other thing is that in this time in most world city, it's not, necessarily the, the area that's had the highest le level of casualties. Um, so it's not only in the targeting in terms of the the group and the population, but also the location overall. So just thinking about those things, how could we um, adapt or apply this approach in more of an emergency context where, I mean, this, this is a project that, as has been said, took longer than expected. Um, perhaps this goes, you know, you could link it to this uh, uh, recommendation that India was making about a two-stage um process but how do we kind of get this behavior change aspect and apply it to where you know where there's a, kind of a high level of uh, accidents that would be um something i'd like to hear about yeah but well done to everyone for that on the uh, on the gender diversity mainstreaming side i think that was uh, we were you know really um uh, impressed with the, the work that was uh, done on this project yeah Thanks very much, Dom, and thank you to you and to GICHD for the steer on that, on the gender diversity side as well, because I know that we had several thoughts in the early stages that, that you just directed us in a better way in order to actually incorporate those things, so we appreciate the help. Um, India, let me pitch to you first. Do you have thoughts on the targeting side of things? 
and how this might be done in a more emergency context where maybe there isn't time for the data collection um, from the victim standpoint. Yeah, thank you, Kim. And I think it's also answering Jane's question in the in the chat. And I just touched on that point of, of what really happened after we did that retrospective victim accident data, because we then were in a situation where we had designed a, a project for a target group, but that group wasn't necessarily the group that had had the most explosive ordnance accidents in Mosul Old City. And by that stage, we we had delivered the project. And you know, I, th I think personally, there's a lot to be said for the project we delivered is what the community wanted. And that was very much an essence of the project. Um, so I still think we took the right approach, but I do think having had that information before, um, things things really could have been differently, but that, that was part of the nature of the project itself. Um, and Dominic, I think your point about Mosul Old City itself, Madeline and Celine, this might be one for you, was, was the location um, of Old City specified by Anmas Celine, or was that chosen by Halo? I didn't, I never even knew that. No, the location was specified by Anmas. Based on, um, based on accident data. It was based on a, the central database that is available uh, in um, Iraq, and it's based, you know, off like personal observations uh, from our uh, from Unmass's end as well at that time. Um, it was also based off like linkages with, you know, what has been done in the past um, and, and the strategy that we had. Uh, where there was the focus on Mosul uh, and to complement our existing activities that are ongoing. So at that time, you know, there was risk education uh, for the unaware, misinformed and uninformed. There was also clearance going on in the area. And so it just tied in nicely to provide a more like, comprehensive approach. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sue, for the context. <laughs> Thanks very much. Dom, did you have a follow on to that? No, um, not uh, not particularly. That's that's great. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like Calvin has his hand raised. Calvin, over to you. Hi, Kim. Hi, everyone. I just uh, my name is Calvin Rice, and I'm director of programs for the Halo Trust. I just uh, want to thank everyone for this fantastic presentation today, and and also, I mean, what a what a wonderful. Uh, projects that you've all collectively delivered. What an amazing sort of team approach with a whole range of different actors involved. And Selena, maybe just would like to turn to you and just credit you and say, well done <laughs> for having the vision to get this particular piece started. Uh, I think, it, you know, from an outside perspective, uh, for someone who was able to, to visit the site last uh, spring, it's really impressive to see how this has has come about, and 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 again, just a wonderful team effort, and and I think it has drawn quite a lot of interest, and I'm pleased for that, and I hope there are opportunities for similar such approaches, which seem well thought through, well considered, um, in other contexts in which we, as a a family of mine action operators, work. So, Celine, well done for your vision. Thank you. Thanks, Calvin. I think there was one more hand. Was it Mariana? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you, everyone, and Halo Trust for the presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to point out two things. Um, one, which I really, really enjoyed um, looking at, is what, what you said at last, that we did something that the community wanted. And I think it's really important, apart from you know, the behavior change and our mind action strategy, doing something the act like the community really wants, maybe outside of, of the, the pure mind action sector is, is absolutely great. And taking into account, you know, daily lives of people, that, that's amazing. And a second thing uh, I would um, I don't know, we, in many countries now we're having, we're facing problems with scrap metal collectors. And I know they were taking a bit out of the survey, uh, which is understandable, but I think, you know, when taking a risk is a source of income for some people, this gets more tricky. And I think as mine action sector, which is, we should definitely work a bit more on, 
you know, not the, the only the recreational kind of part of it that I'm not saying it's easy, but, you know, it's it's a bit more obvious for us to do something quickly and efficiently to to avoid bad behaviors. But when, you know, um, it, it's 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 a strategy to to get money. Um, this is much harder. And I think as my election sector, we should uh, probably more investigate on this part of it. But thank you very much. It was a great project and very inspiring. Thank you. That's a valid point. Selena or India or MJ, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I can comment on it. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I agree with Marianne. Uh, she makes a very valid point. Um, I think, you know, that's one of the things that we have been thinking about when, or what I had been thinking about when I launched a project um, or the CFP. I do think as well, though, what um, India had said that it might contribute to more harm by promoting dangerous behavior was also a very, very valid point. And I think I just wished we had more time to actually explore that and go into more detail on it. Also the understanding that that kind of a project probably have been more costly. Um, and so there was also the budget issue in that too. And so the point that the CFP could have been um, divided into two is well taken. Thank you. I think we will wrap it up there and just reiterate the thanks and what Calvin mentioned of this was a massive team effort with Unmasked Halo, Al God, the community, the architect, the municipality. Um, there were many players involved in making that GSHD, thank you very much, um, and making this happen. So reiterate our thanks to that group. And I will pass it over to Caitlin for the networking portion. And the questions that remain, uh, we will take them out of the chat and answer them in writing. And if anybody has additional questions, they can feel free to put them in the chat now or email Caitlin. I'll volunteer you for that if that works and to pass them on to us. Thanks, Kim. And yeah, I, I see some really interesting questions in the chat. Um, so definitely we will we will follow up on those and reply. Um, so if you want to feed any questions through, you can send them to my email. Hopefully you should all have it from your registration. Um, I want to really thank uh, Kim and all of you panelists um, for presenting. I think you've done an excellent job of setting out lessons learned and recommendations for the sector. Um, and I hope that uh, your messages um, will be carried for a long time and can spur some more discussions within the sector. Um, there, in terms of the next ERE hour, a quick message on that. Uh, we have not had a volunteer to host it. Um, but I would say stay tuned uh, because there um, is probably going to be something done with that window. Uh, so you will receive all a message about that in your emails later on. Now, as we enter the second part of this webinar, which is the networking circle, I'm going to stop the recording. As mentioned, this recording will be available online on the advisory group's YouTube page at a later date. <laughs>